Welcome to Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with John Kaiser. Welcome back to the show, John. Jim, happy to be back on the show. John, Zephyr Minerals collapsed today on news from El Plomo. Did Zephyr lose the World Cup? Zephyr Minerals I was halted this morning for a news release that reported a visual description of the first hole into the El Plomo target. And yes, the keeper dove the wrong way and they lost the World Cup. The headline was pretty brutal. It says it was not successful in intercepting significant sulfide mineralization. So the stock, which had gotten very quiet in the last couple of days while we waited for them to finish this hole, it plunged from about 95 cents all the way down to 25 cents where it's uh, traded over 4 million, 4 million shares at this stage. Now, the target was not a total bust the way the news release made it sound. They said that they had shipped a 2.9 meter interval of magnetic sulfide mineralization for assaying. Now, sulfide is, is, um, a metal, a metal that's combined with sulfur. And normally, uh, sulfides are iron sulfides, uh, pyrite, pyrotite, and nobody is interested in those types of sulfides. And you had to dig really deep to realize that the uh, zone of zinc, lead, silver mineralization that had been intercepted way back in 1971 or 81, whenever that was, uh, that ran high, lead, zinc, and silver grades, they actually intercepted this considerably down depth from the shallow drilling that was done many decades ago. And But they were so worried about describing Sphalerite and Galena in the visuals that they just left it at sulfide. So that left the market scratching. Was this whole broken hill type target uh, an illusion? And the whole idea was that there was a, uh, because of the magnetic anomaly that showed that at depth, the magnetism bulges, that the flatter, narrower zone that had been intersected by the shallow drilling ages ago had undergone folding compression and therefore thickening and that the pyrotite that ends up uh, uh, formed from the pyrite in these old SEDEX system, uh, that's what was causing this big magnetic anomaly. And yet when they finally got through this magnetic anomaly, or at least where it's supposed to be, there wasn't really anything to explain what caused the magnetism, except in the foot wall of this zone, which appears to be the extension of thinner version of what is closer to the surface. In the foot wall, there is similar nisic rock that, they, that is in the hanging wall, but it has a bunch of mafic bands in it, which interestingly have disseminated sulfides. They didn't call it mineralization. They just called it sulfides, which means it's probably uh, iron sulfides. Yet they've grabbed a few representative samples of this and shipped that off for assaying just in case it is gold. But they've shut down drilling for the season. Uh, they want to get the geochemical assays uh, of the interval and the surrounding rocks so that they can send it off to Paul Spry, the uh, Broken Hill expert, and ask him, okay, what is going on? Do your thin section work. Uh, why, why do we have this big magnetic anomaly suggesting that the, there has been structural thickening and that there are massive sulfide presence? present, and all we hit is this 2.9 meter interval, and it might actually run high numbers, but the problem is this was supposed to be a Cannington scale target, and the geophysics suggests that that sort of footprint, the stock had made it over a buck on speculation that this drill hole could go through, you know, 30 to 50 meters of massive sulfide mineralization, indicating that there's a, you know, 40 to 50 million ton body of enriched zinc silver mineralization present and something like that. If you found a Cannington today, that would be worth over seven billion Canadian. So this was like a Boise's Bay type of hope, a, a big score. Junior puts together the geological context, drills a, a, a blind hole up beneath uh, some near surface mineralization um, with a target that no geophysical target nobody had ever expected, and then suddenly pulls 
uh, you know, 100 meters of uh, 4% nickel, 3% copper that immediately everybody can calculate. Here's a 30 million ton body that can be open pit mine. In this case, it would have had to have been underground mine, but it ended up being a $4 billion buyout at the end of the day for diamond fields. And when the market got this bad news, it, it collapsed. The drilling season in this area ends at the end of October. It is unlikely that they will continue drilling by using this depressing statement about not intercepting uh, significant sulfide mineralization. They're signaling that the target now is considerably diminished. They will probably eventually go back uh, uh, next year when the uh, drill season between July and October resumes, uh, assuming the work that Dr. Paul Spry uh, does says that, well, there is something there. It's obviously not as big as Cannington, but it might be still interesting and worth drilling a couple holes into. So now they've shifted the focus back to the original Plan A, which was the existing gold system that they have. And that's a fairly high-grade system of plunging gold load zones. They have 130,000 ounces of this outline. They even did a PEA for it. And when that gold, gold at 1900 to $2,000, that's pretty interesting. The problem with that Dawson segment is that the load zones plunge into the mountain. And to chase them deeper, you need to step up the mountain, and then you end up with holes that deviate and take forever and cost too much. So they, they need to drive and add it down in there and drill this thing from underground. And when gold was twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 for the past decade, that was not conceivable. So maybe down the road, if this gold continues to do strongly, and, and yesterday, of course, uh, the, the Federal Reserve said that we're not going to be worrying about inflation for quite some time. Interest rates are going to stay low. We need to allow this economy to rebuild for, for you know, before worrying about inflation creeping up. So the case for higher gold prices is strong. And they also spent the, the they spent the summer doing prospecting and sampling on the Green Mountain segment, which is to the west of El Pomo, and this has some uh, old copper, copper small scale copper mining in there. It hasn't really been explored for gold, but it has similar potential to the to the Dawson segment uh, to the east. So there they can drill probably uh, much of that area they can drill year-round. So if they generate targets uh, in that area, um, they, uh, they, they may be able to get drilling programs going over the winter. If the market uh, comes to terms with the fact that the Cannington clone is not going to happen and looks at this again as a gold play and, and they have now two million dollars uh, in the treasury of the 35 cent warrants that got accelerated to September 11 they managed to get about five hundred thousand dollars of those uh, exercised uh, in the next couple of weeks the stock's probably going to languish here and not claw its way back over 35 cents and those warrants will die but the company is still in reasonably good shape it was quite exciting to, uh, you know, have a shot at something that could take a uh, stock into the, you know, 10, 20, 30 dollar range. But that obviously is not going to happen. They did not win the World Cup. They are now back in the minor leagues focusing on the gold potential of the uh, Dawson Green Mountain project in Colorado. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after this. Value from success, growth, and discovery. Golden Arrow Resources is a well-funded gold copper exploration company with proven management and prospective properties in Chile, Argentina, and Paraguay. Golden Arrow trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange, symbol GRG, on Frankfurt, symbol G6A, and the OTCQB, symbol GARWF. For more information, visit us at goldenarrowresources.com or call Sean at 778-686-0135. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, where is Midas Gold with its Stibnite permitting cycle? 
Well, on August 14th, the U.S. Forest Service accepted the draft environmental impact statement for the Stibnite uh, Gold Antimony Project in Idaho. And they put, they have put online 80 reports representing 27,000 pages, um, supporting the 5,000 page EIS statement. And that has kicked off a 60 day public comment period that ends on October 13th, where anybody can go to a special website, uh, put up by the U.S. Forest Service and write a letter about what they think. And, and normally it's people who are hostile to mining. They'll come in there and, express concerns about this or that, but people who are also supportive of mining can also go and put in their comments and point out, well, this is really, you know, potentially good. We would like to see this happen. And this project, uh, it's, it's very different from, say, Northern Dynasty's Pebble Copper Gold Project in Alaska, which this week got hammered uh, as a result of talk that uh, they would need to do some special wetlands mitigation, which seems to have arisen because uh, some of the Trump family members like to uh, hunt up in that, hunt and fish in that area and uh, bought all the stuff that this mine will absolutely destroy a vast, giant region. And that stock collapsed from the 2 to $3 range to, to below a dollar amid the fallout that maybe the Trump administration is going to interfere with the future development of the Pebble Project. And that one, you know, copper gold system, it's extremely large. It'll be an important long-lived mine. And they have put a lot of effort also into the uh, environmental impact statement to, to mitigate the risk of uh, tailing spill uh, going down into the watershed and then into the ocean and, and creating and doing havoc on the uh, salmon fishery. The Stibnite project is already an area where the salmon fishery was trashed in the 40s by the American war effort, which required antimony to be mined. And in the decades before the uh, EPA got invented and started uh, paying attention to what mining companies were doing to the environment, gold miners went and wrecked this area. So it's actually a restoration project of, of a super fun site that's going to be funded by a gold mine. This company spent 50 million U.S. by the end of uh, December last year just on the permitting cycle, which started in December, uh, in, in 2016. And Stephen Quinn has estimated by the time they're done, hopefully at the end of 2021, with a record of decision and a mine permit in hand, they'll have spent 70 million U.S. just on the permitting cycle. And they have addressed all these concerns. Now, this public comment period still will allow all the cranks to come out there and complain about these obscure things. And when this is done, there will be some sort of response where each of the comments are, are addressed. The, the obviously, the frivolous ones will be saving, you know, not, not relevant. But there may come up stuff that hasn't really been addressed in the four years that the U.S. Forest Service and multiple agencies have worked with Midas Gold to figure out, okay, what are all the, the things that would be bad that you could do that can be done in a way that is actually helpful? And that all that feedback and response to that will hopefully result in the filing of a final environmental impact statement sometime in the second quarter of uh, next year. And then there is something called a public objection period. But that is not a free-for-all like the current 60-day comment period. That's where anything that was submitted during this period that for some reason was ignored by the U.S. Forest Service they, they can refile the complaint and say, you have not properly responded to this concern that we have for moving forward on this project. So the Midas Gold, uh, you know, has, has done well in, in, the, in the last while. Uh, the gold trend uh, is in the right direction. Um, during a webinar that Stephen Quinn did to talk about the environmental uh, impact statement, um, he he was asked the question, uh, um, you know, how big is your, can you give us a range as to how much your CapEx is going to explode? And he didn't really want to answer that, but he did say it's definitely not going to double. So it's not going to go from a billion bucks to two billion. So it's going to be somewhere in between. And the big question everybody has now is, 
after the comments period is over, sometime in the fourth quarter, Midas will file an updated or, or, or a feasibility study that incorporates all the work done in the last four years and that addresses all these concerns that have been brought up since the pre-feasibility study was completed in late 2014 before this permitting cycle was, um, you know, was completed. Now, the, the Midas Gold story, it has tremendous upside according to the way I model, the way the, uh, the feasibility study might look. Uh, at the current price, uh, the target range um, is in Canadian dollars, a four to seven dollar range. If you go crazy and say three thousand dollars is the, is the new reality, um, then you're talking like a nine to fourteen, fourteen dollar stock price range. So there is tremendous leverage in the stock right now. The fact that it's still trading around dollar seventy five, which which is based on the five hundred and forty million fully diluted, almost a billion dollar valuation, that pricing is telling you that the market either doesn't believe that a permit will ever be granted in Idaho for the Stipnite project, uh, or that gold's going to collapse back into the thirteen four hundred dollar. Thirteen hundred to fourteen hundred dollar range, where such a valuation makes sense. So Midas Gold continues to be um, my my top undeveloped gold play, and there are also ESG reasons to like it. In addition to them restoring access for salmon to a watershed upstream that hasn't been available since the 1940s because of the antimony mining back then, these guys through this very process of going through this permitting cycle, they ended up educating the U.S. Forest Service and all these agencies who also self-educate themselves because they've never permitted a project this large in Idaho that also involves reclaiming a Superfund uh, environmental disaster site. And in the process, they've gotten the rules and all that together. And if this project passes, this will be a boon for Idaho uh, projects because the Idaho permitting system will know how to deal with mining applications. It'll have the regime figured out. It'll take a lot less time. So Midas Gold will, through its $70 million effort, have created a public good in that regard. And there's the public good that's created in restoring the salmon uh, upstream into, into that watershed. And then there's a third public good which is that the antimony byproduct credit, it could come in very handy. The What, what they would end up producing uh, annually on average would be about 3 to 4% of global supply right now. But 92% of global supply comes from China, Russia, and Tajikistan. And the rest comes from a whole bunch of other countries that do not look particularly stable and in some cases quite unfriendly to the United States, like like uh, Iran. The only two friendly ones in there are Mexico and Australia, and, and they represent you know, less than 1% of global supply. So if this mine gets built, the United States will end up having more than enough of its own domestic antimony needs if we end up in a global conflict with these other autocracy countries uh, end up squared off against the democracies of the world, which hopefully the United States will continue to be, then the United States will be able to supply antimony from this mine for other countries that are still, you know, that it is still aligned with uh, uh, because they are democracies and not uh, autocracies. So there are additional ESG reasons to own Midas Gold beyond the potential to make an awful lot of money when this gets approved and say gold goes even higher than its current level, which is already high enough to make the stock undervalued, assuming that the uh, kind of uh, PFS numbers that we had don't change too dramatically when the feasibility study is released uh, later this year. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. 
surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines. Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, Tri Origin has completed its rollback. Has the stock dropped post rollback as you feared? Well, in this regard, uh, we have good news. Uh, the stock uh, was trading seven cents or so, so five for one. It should have been, uh, you know, thirty-five cents, seven and a half, you know, thirty-five, forty cents. And in fact, the lows that's traded is thirty-two, thirty-three cents. It has not broken to thirty cents. They had to wait several days for the stock. The stock exchange insisted you have to let the stock stabilize before you try to do a private placement. And this persistent buying that we saw in the sort of four to seven cent range, even though everybody knew there was a five for one rollback coming, it has continued. And it is not really clear who it is. It appears to be a diversified audience of people who understand the upside potential of its key projects, which are Sky Lake and North Abitibi, both in in, in 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 Ontario. And earlier this week, or last week I should say, on on the twenty fourth, the company finally set the price of a private placement. And I was quite shocked because they are doing three million shares at thirty five cents for hard dollars and two and a half million flow through at forty three cents uh, to raise about two point one million dollars, and I and I'm shocked because they did not include any warrants. It seems to be absolutely mandatory for Canadian companies to hand out warrants. The standard Rick Rule thing used to be a full five-year warrant. It's now a full three-year warrant. Companies insist on that, but Bob Valiant is saying no. We roll this stock back. The company uh, is undervalued with this financing. Uh, we would have only 36 million shares fully diluted. With 2 million bucks, we will go start to work on the Sky Lake project. This is supposed to close by the end of September. Uh, they are taking, uh, you know, orders from people. It's not brokered. There's no uh, big shot on Bay Street who is the lead on this, placing it with their favorite uh, clip and flip clients. This is being done almost as a people's type play where it's been sold to people who understand the story, come to the company, want to buy size that is, uh, you know, greater than you can buy. Like you couldn't buy two, three hundred thousand shares at uh, 35 cents. So you would have to go for a private placement. You would get a four month hold. There's no bonus warrant in it. But if they execute on this plan, then they hope to put a couple holes into the Coval deposit, which already exists on the Sky Lake project. Uh, there, there's probably um, it, the historic data is not 43101 compliant. The core was all lost that was drilled in the past. So TriOrigin wants to go in there, drill a couple core holes into that, so it can do its logging and structural analysis, and then set the stage for returning back in January. They don't want to drill in November, December, which is a messy freeze-up period. But with that data, they'll be able to link it to the geophysics they've done. They would want to go further down, down plunge to see what's up below the 100 meter depth that this has only been drilled to. And of course, a long strike. And they have 27 kilometers of strike in this area that's basically untested. So they've got a fantastic play that's going to start delivering decent gold results. And admittedly, those will be kind of repeating what's already known. But by the end of the year, with only 36 million fully diluted, uh, there will be appetite to raise flow-through or to do flow-through financing in this company um, in December, where they'll probably be able to add a lot more money to this company for next year's drilling program. So although I was disappointed they did this five-for-one rollback, they uh, 
I'm, I'm pleased that uh, they're doing it in a way which leaves a lot upside because at the 35 cent price, the fully diluted is only a 13 million dollar valuation. And their, their North Abitibi project, which is on the Ontario side of the Casa Barardi trend, that also has existing mineralized zones that they also want to tackle next year. So on two fronts, if this company does get this financing done, they'll start attracting attention from people who recognize that this is a potential um, analog for Amex Exploration, who worked on its Perone project uh, for for decades, and everybody was dismissive about it. And today, it has a three hundred million dollar valuation. Stocks at three thirty. They've got over twenty million bucks in the treasury raised to do this job properly. So I expect a similar process to unfold with Triogen. And what's interesting, I called it a people play. They have made the existing security holder exemption available with people who are not accredited. In other words, not millionaires. If they're Canadian, they can uh, do up to $15,000 per 12-month period per company uh, just by saying they own shares. And I asked the, the company, well, how do you know they own shares? Well, they're signing a contract where they're verifying that they own shares. What more do I need to uh, need to do? I can't uh, you know, do anything beyond that. So uh, I asked them, well, what about... Uh, what happens if somebody just says they have shares? Or will they go to jail because they said they own shares in this company and are putting money directly into the treasury rather than just putting their money directly into the market, which they're totally uh, entitled to do if they don't own the uh, shares already? And Bob Valiant just shrugs and says, you know, <laughs> that's not my area of expertise. But this financing is really only of interest to uh, non-millionaires who uh, want the flow-through benefit. You get to write the entire amount off against your income. The tax saving is your marginal tax rate. Uh, your cost base goes to zero, so anything you sell it for becomes subject to capital gains. Uh, as far as doing the hard dollars, you could only buy about 42,000 shares with that. That you can probably get in the market. So the the single, if, if there were a warrant attached, I'd say people go for that. Don't buy it in the market. Get that warrant so that you have leveraged exposure to this story. But if you want to dabble in flow through, take a look at the uh, flow through if you want to do the uh, $15,000 flow through part. John, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. We've been speaking with John Kaiser, his website, kaiserresearch.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Discovery Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Discovery Watch is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.